we are pleased to welcome Pastor Doug Wilson as our speaker tonight. After his lectures, there will be a Q&A. So please be ready with your questions. As Pastor Wilson speaks, we recognize some listeners will disagree with his content. Great, now moving on. <laughs> on, the campus, on the campus of a taxpayer-funded university, what you just did is proper. Free discourse among diverse groups is one of the university's central commitments. So as you listen, we ask you to keep this in mind. Free speech is one of our most cherished civil rights. We Christians, disagree with much of the doctrine and practice of sexuality here at Indiana University. We have not tried to silence those opposed to God's moral law. So we call you to give our speaker a fair hearing. If there are efforts to disrupt our exercise of free speech, we will take the necessary steps to restore order. Now a word about our speaker. Pastor Wilson married his wife, Nancy, in 1975. Shortly after that time, two daughters and one son began to enliven dinner table conversations. Becca, the oldest, is now a graduate of New St. Andrews, married to Ben Merkel and a mother of five. Nathan is a graduate of NSA in St. John's, a father of five and a best-selling author with Random House Publishing. Rachel, the youngest, who also graduated from NSA, is married to Luke Jankovic and is a mother of five with number six on the way. She is the author of Loving the Little Years. Doug's wife is also a well-known author of books for women, as well as one textbook on English grammar. Pastor Wilson received an MA in philosophy, and he has been the servant of Christ Church since 1977. On top of that, now brace yourselves, he drives a 99 Ford F-250 pickup. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. There's more. It's painted a rich hunter green. And I know that makes you all happy, doesn't it? <laughs> Pastor Wilson has written various books. Crossway Books has published his Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning, and Canon Press has published Persuasions and per in Reforming Marriage, as well as other odds and ends which come into his head. In addition to his role as pastor of Christ Church, he is the author and editor of Credenda Agenda magazine, which Given the other editors he has to work with, he has way too much fun. Wilson is also the founder of Gray Friars Hall, a three-year ministerial training program. Doug Wilson is the, and the famous skeptic Christopher Hitchens co-authored a book titled, is, Christiana, is Christianity Good for the World? After writing the book, the two went on a debate tour of colleges, and the film titled Collision documents their tour. Before his untimely death, a few months ago, Christopher Hitchens said this, I have discovered that the so-called Christian right is much less monolithic and very much more polite and hospitable than I would have once thought, or more than, or more than most liberals believe. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Doug Wilson. Well, how are you doing? Good to see you here. One of the best, best cartoons I saw was uh, one with an auditorium emptying out, and the guy at the lectern said, well, I see the next speaker needs no introduction. I, I think that that may be uh, working in reverse here. Um, I'm very grateful for everyone who's here, very grateful for your presence, and, and I'm looking forward to our engagement together. One of the things I've hoped for, one of the things I uh, have prayed for uh, in this is that uh, many people will come away from this evening surprised. That's what I would like. I would like us to walk away surprised, thinking, you know, 
that's not what I thought was going to happen. Well, let's see if we can make that happen. I want to talk, the two talks are um, creation sexuality and redemption sexuality. The first I want to talk about um, man, and, man and woman created in God's image together, as it says in Genesis, reflecting God's image by creation. And in the second talk, I want to talk about how uh, redemption, uh, how salvation plays into the picture of sexuality that, uh, that we are given in the scripture. And I hope that we have uh, some very good, engaging, lively interaction in the Q&A. From a biblical perspective, if, if we look around at our culture today, things seem to be falling apart. Things seem to be dis disintegrating. And it would be very easy for people who have a Christian worldview to despair. Uh, what do we do about this? How, how are we to understand this? The first thing that we should do, I think, is not grab a sign, not run out and protest what we don't like. I think the first order of business is to try to figure out figure out what's going on, figure out what, uh, what's driving this, where did this come from. In Psalm 115, the psalmist says this, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. We are seeking to understand the disintegration of our culture around us from a biblical perspective. Others are rejoicing in what they, rejoicing in what's developing and are trying to advance it and are trying to encourage it along. But both those perspectives, the, the reaction away from it, the recoiling away from what's happening in our culture or the applause uh, for what's happening in our culture, are reflective of different worldviews that come from somewhere. And I want to talk about where that somewhere is. We have to keep coming back to a foundational principle. I would argue that worship, and I don't mean altars and candles and sanctuaries, but worship is uh, service. Worship fundamentally drives everything that we do. If we're Christians, if we're Buddhists, if we're Hindus, if we're Muslims, and, and if we're secularists, worship Service drives everything that we do. Worship drives and shapes all of human existence. And I want to argue, according to this principle, you become like what you worship. You become like what you worship. If you picture an ultimate reality and you vi envision it a certain way and you give yourself to the service of that ultimate reality, you are going to find yourself increasingly conformed to that ultimate image. Notice this principle in the text in Psalm 115. The idolaters in Psalm 115 are worshiping idols that have mouths, but they can't speak with them. They have eyes, but they're blind. They have ears, but they're deaf. Their noses don't enable them to smell. Their hands cannot handle, and their feet cannot walk. Those who make these idols, the psalmist says, are just like them. You become like what you worship. So what you, what you worship defines what you think is valuable. This is why it's not an accident, for example, and, uh, and this, is, uh, uh, this is something that I think uh, I want you to, I'm going to ask you to bear with me here. In, in Muslim countries, under Sharia law, it's not an accident, for example, it's not an accident that everything is in, uh, translated in terms of power. So wh where does that come from? Well, it comes from your, your, what you're worshiping. What do you think your, what's your notion of God? Allah, it, because Muslims deny the doctrine of the Trinity, Allah is a, uh, an ultimate hermit God. In 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, Christian John defines God as love. God is love. He doesn't say God has love or God from time to time loves, but God is love. But you can't be love unless there's a beloved, all right? You can't be love unless there's a beloved. If you're a solitary hermit before creation, before there's anything, and you're the only entity there is, you can't, you can't have love be what shapes and defines you. Christians have understood the Trinity as the doctrine of the ultimacy of love, the ultimacy of love. So John says God is love. So for Christians, God is a society. God is um, 
one God, three persons, and the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the Father loves the Spirit, and so on. But if you believe that Allah does not, and Christians believe, that God gives himself, God reveals himself, in, in uh, Islam, God, Allah, just reveals his will. Um, a Muslim is one who submits to that will. So the pr principal duty is simply submission. Now, is it any surprise that if a Muslim man, for example, believes that this is how the universe operates, that he's going to reflect that downstream when it comes to people who he believes are under his authority? So why, why do you have a power relation where it's just, you do what I say? That's the, that's the way it has to be. Well, well why in the Christian nation is it a power relation? Uh, we'll get to the Q&A. Um, when, when you have this situation, you, you have people reflecting what they believe ultimate reality is. Now, what does this mean in a secularist society? What does this mean in a secularist society? What does it mean for the materialistic atheist or for New Age neo-pagans and so forth? Are you fucking serious? Uh, I have been all day. <laughs> so, both of these groups, both of these groups believe that ultimate reality, ultimate reality is infinitely malleable. Ultimate reality is infinitely malleable. The materialist believes that matter is eternal and that given enough time, anything can turn into anything else. In the beginning was an enormous amount of hydrogen with lots of potential. That's what evolution is all about. You have this big bang, you have an, an enormous amount of hydrogen, and this hydrogen can turn over time into sea lions and yellow little yellow canaries and people and, and supernovas and so on. Anything can morph into anything else. Anything can morph into anything else. This is, the, this is basic to the uh, materialistic mindset. You see the same thing in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, in, in, in Ovid, in the beginning, chaos gave birth to the gods, and they in turn shaped other stuff. And for the rest of Metamorphoses, shape-shifting was the order of the day. I hope my son is gay! <laughs> And I hope that Jesus forgives him just like he does the rest of us. <laughs> so, so, Shape-shifting, there's an, uh, okay, I, uh, I, I need to ask you to bear with me here. This is a university, and I'm laying out the premises of what used to be called an argument. <laughs> there, here's the, what I'm saying is premise number one is you become like what you worship. You, you reflect what you think ultimate reality is. And shape-shifting, metamorphoses, is one of the fundamental tenets that you, one of the fundamental uh, characteristics that you see of uh, pagan thought uh, throughout, through the centuries, and you see it in secular thought today. This is the theological slash religious explanation, I would argue, for all forms of gender bending not to mention Michael Jackson's face. People, people today, people today genuinely believe that it is possible and within their grasp to reinvent themselves. What you, they don't believe in fixed givens. And I'm arguing they don't believe in fixed givens because of their view of the universe. All right, so people today believe that it's possible, it's entirely up to you, to reinvent yourself if you want. I want to argue that sexual boundaries, sexual uh, definitions, follow the same kind of pattern. The revolt of our current generation against the triune God who made heaven and earth is a revolt in the direction of a pagan polytheism. 
multiple gods, multiple voices, multiple laws, and a general clamor out of which it's possible to select whatever suits the individual at the time. The political name for this is pluralism. Diversity is another name for it. The philosophical and cultural name for it is postmodernism. Radically relativistic, radically relativistic, whether it means to be or not, it has fallen off a cliff and cannot be prevented from eventually hitting the craggy rocks below, which I would say are nihilism and despair. <laughs> but while falling, a number of people, while falling, a number of people have the temporary sensation of absolute freedom, and they seek to use that freedom in the creation and pursuit of various sexualities. That's part of the freedom that they think they have. That is why we are dealing with metrosexuals, sodomites, catamites, lesbians, vir virtual perverts, We weren't, uh, we weren't taking a vote. Um, <laughs> bisexuals and transgendered individuals, not to mention, not, not, not to mention the ecclesiastical variants, the Lesbaterians. Some, <laughs> sometime, Sometime in the next 10 years, sometime in the next 10 years, look for more to push to the front of the line, all demanding societal respectability. All right, all of them. And this would include, and everybody says, no, 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 it doesn't include that. And I'd say, well, yes, it kind of does. Because you can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't have absolute freedom and then say, no, no, wait, we can't do that. So, what is going to happen is, uh, what will push to the front of the line is, uh, uh, <laughs> pederasty, uh, pedophilia, bestiality, are, <laughs> if you believe, if you believe that, as Alfred Kinsey did, that, that children are sexual from birth and express that sexuality, if you believe that, if what you believe about ultimate reality is going to drive your behavior. So what, what happens is this, and, and while I'm... Are you cheering for pedophilia? Q&A, Q&A is coming up. Q&A is coming up. One of, the, one of the things that we have to recognize, let, let's, let's just give you, uh, let me give a, uh, a, an example. People say, if, if, in these culture war debates, people will say something like, uh, people on my side of the line will say, hey, what about uh, polygamy? Oh, no, we're not talking about that. We're not demanding it. Uh, everybody, it's just two people, you know. Well, what, have you noticed that limiting marriage rights to two is hatred against bisexuals? <laughs> it's, it's hate. Can, are, are, bisexuals, are bisexuals allowed to express their sexuality through marriage? Yes. Th through marriage. So there has to be at least three. Oh, yeah. so, okay. okay, there has to be at least, there has to be at least three in the marriage. Okay. Let's keep calm, carry on. Because all of this is a function, I would argue, of sexual postmodernism, we should simply call all of it, the whole shebang, homosexuality. You, can, you, cannot believe, you cannot believe that ultimate reality is infinitely malleable, and yet not believe that the world we live in is equally malleable. You can't believe that ultimate reality is infinitely malleable and not think that you have the right within your particular subset of that world to morph and shift and change and reinvent however it suits you. I'm simply saying that that particular practice is a function of a religious commitment. It's a function of a belief in a higher reality outside of what Congress does, outside of what our state legislators do, outside of what the churches and so forth say, and so on. So if you believe that, 
if, if you believe that ultimate reality is infinitely malleable, you're going to think that that translates down here. If, on the other hand, as a believing Christian, you believe that God created the world, put it here largely as it is, and divided things and put them in their various categories, that belief is going to drive your commitments. That, that belief is going to translate out to your day-to-day uh, -to -day, uh, your, your -day activity. In the world created by the God of Scripture, the boundaries don't blur. It's not like you left a watercolor out in the rain. God divides, and God calls those divisions good. God divides, and call, God calls those divisions good. For example, God created the heavens and earth at the very beginning, and the very first thing that he did by doing that was create a division between God and that which is not God. So when God created the world, there was now God and not God. God on one side, and the creator on one side, and the creation on the other. And God said that which was not God, that which is on the other side of the line, was good. So God says that's good. Over there, that's good. It's not God, but it's good. That gulf was an infinite one, and God called, uh, God called all of it good. Having done this, God was on a roll, and he divided the sun and the moon. He divided the sea and the dry land. He divided the earth and the sky, and he kept calling it all of it good. So at every stage of the game, he created this, and he called it good. He created this next thing, and he called it good. He created the next thing, and he called it good. And then, as I am fond of saying at wedding ceremonies, the, the first thing he says that was not good was he got, he, he got to a solitary, he got to a solitary, <laughs> If you don't like what he's saying, you can leave, please. Officer, remove that man, please. Don't touch me. Hey, don't touch me. Hey. Easy. Hey, 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 come on now. Okay, thank you. Picking up where we were. God creates this, at this stage, he says, it's good. At, at the next stage, he says, it's good. At the next stage, he says, it's good. And then he gets to a solitary male, one guy. And God says, it's not good. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. So good, good, good. Solitary male, not so good. This, this boy needs some improvement. So... What does he do?
Officer. Okay. Whoever the ringleader is. God. Steve Elkamp, the Assistant Dean of Students, and for all you IU students, at the Freshman Induction Ceremony, you, uh, you uh, pledged an oath to Indiana University's Indiana Promise, uh, talking about the civility and dignity of all persons. Uh, so I ask of you, um, since you're on the Indiana University campus and a part of this community, to treat everyone with business dignity and respect. So if you don't like what's being said, leave. Uh, if you want to protest, please do so uh, in a peaceful manner uh, so we can have be a marketplace of ideas. Uh, marketplace of ideas. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for being here and uh, for participating in this uh, lively discussion. Um, and uh, again, no, uh, no disruption of the uh, activities or the speech that's being offered up here, no matter how much you disagree or agree with it, uh, so we can continue. Thank you. And IUPD officers, if you do choose to disrupt the event, um, like we would with any other speech, uh, heckling or, or such, we'll uh, tap you on the shoulder and ask you to uh, gracefully leave. Thank you. And I would like, as the, as the speaker involved, I would like to personally extend my thanks to Indiana University for their commitment to free, free discussion. And this is not the first time I've run, run into the tolerance buzzsaw. Diversity, diversity has two fundamental tenets. As, I, as, as far as I've been able to glean from my interactions with the tolerance police. The, the, the diversity crowd has two fundamental tenets. The first is that they have an absolute commitment to free speech. The second tenet is shut up. And we have a witness. We have a, this, in, in a minute, revival's gonna break out. And we have a witness, you shut up. You shut up. Now, see, what it, what it boils down to is this. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. If you, if you want diversity, then show me how committed you are to it. D diversity is, is, is not the sort of thing that you can get if you have signs and slogans that you cluster together with people who agree with you, and then, and you, as, the, as we said back in the day, singing songs and carrying signs, as Buffalo Springfield said, mostly say hooray for our side. That is a problem, all right? That is a problem, and if I may speak frankly, it's not mine. So, God, God, says, uh, God says that he created the world, and it's good, created the world, is good, it's not good that man be alone, and he made a helper suitable for him, made someone uh, made someone complimentary and, and complimentary to him and it says very explicitly male and female created he them in the image of God he created them the Bible tells us that male and female together carries the image of God it bears the image of God a man by himself doesn't a woman by herself doesn't male and female together say something about God so he, he, at the pinnacle of creation, God creates male and female, and he establishes them, and he, he does this by taking Adam and breaking him. Perfectly good guy, and he 
breaks him. He breaks him into two. And he has one man. He breaks him into two in order that he can take the two and put them back together in a higher unity. So he, he has unity to begin with. He takes Eve from the side of Adam. You now have two, a helper suitable to him. He brings them back together in a higher unity so that uh, she may help him populate the world and she can be the mother of all the living. Now, God does this because he wants to create a richer unity than he had to begin with. It's the kind of unity that presupposes real difference, real diversity. You have to presuppose real division. G.K. Chesterton has a wonderful poem where he says, if I set the town beside the country and the sun beside the moon, or I set the land beside the sea, some, some fool would talk about one of them being better. It's not a foot race. It's not a competition. What we, what we have is a, a, a design that God has established where he wants diverse things to complement one another in a higher unity, in a higher union. So, if you want to be healthy, if you want to be healthy, here's a general rule, you should eat three good meals a day. This is generally true. But if you apply the rule, when you're in the grip of the flu, all you're doing is giving yourself something to throw up. In this situation, in the culture wars in America, what's happening is this. Because there's been a religious seismic shift in our culture, because the worship is being directed in radically different directions, and this is reflected in radically different views of human sexuality and politics and all sorts of things, if Christians try to address this, by legislating, if they try to lobby the legislature and get laws passed, the Defense of Marriage Act, or fighting for traditional values and fighting for those sorts of things, all they're doing is giving the culture something to throw up. Or you're, you're not going to fix the problem. You're not going to fix the problem that way. Politics is not a savior. Only Jesus is our savior. Jesus is my savior, not you. <laughs> That's true. Actually, on the way out, let me say, issue a hearty amen to that. I am no one's savior. I'm a, min I'm, a minister of, I'm a minister of that savior, and I want to declare what Jesus has done. What Jesus has done is he's died, for the, he's died for the sins of the world. Jesus gave himself for the world. So Christians ought not to fight. Christians ought not try to impose a, a Christian culture legal system on top of a religious view that is hostile to that. You're just, you're just taking the fruit of a Christian culture and putting it in a situation where it's, there's going to be a reaction, spectacular reaction. So should we fight, the, should we fight this battle when the, when the general pattern of worship is given over to other, other assumptions entirely? You're only, you're only giving the culture something to react to, something to react against. This does not mean that there's no savior for our culture. It simply means that our culture is itself not that savior. Our culture cannot save itself. Our culture cannot grab itself by its own coat collar and lift itself out of the situation it's in. I want to talk more about this in the second talk when I talk about redemption sexuality. I'm simply talking about how God made the world, how God established the world, and our recognition of that as being a prerequisite to having a culture that uh, honors it and is in harmony with it. So, this doesn't mean that we have no savior for our culture. It means that the culture is not our savior. It doesn't, mean that, it doesn't mean that there's no salvation for our politics, but it just means that politics isn't that savior. Our culture is actually the skid row bum needing to be saved. All right? One of the things that we, one of the things that we have to recognize is that Going back to my first point, you become like, one of the early points, you become like what you worship. When, you, when you're alone, when you're by yourself, when you're reflecting on what do I, you're looking at the stars, who put that there, how'd that get there, how'd I get here, what am I doing here, what is he doing here, what, is, what are the, all these people doing here, who are we? Are we simply the end product of so much time and chance acting on matter? Are we simply so much meat, bones, and protoplasm? Or are we created and shaped in the image of God? How you answer that fundamental question is going to drive everything downstream. Everything downstream from that particular decision is going to be affected by that particular decision. Do you believe that we are created? Or do you believe that we just got here by happenstance? 
Do you believe that God had a sovereign good purpose and plan for establishing this world? Or do you believe that it's all just one, um, one thing happening after another? Christians believe that the non-Christian world needs to be, um, Christians believe the non-Christian world needs to be invited, needs to be called, needs to be summoned to worship God. They, they don't need to be called in the first place to clean up their act according to Christian standards. Uh, telling non-Christians to live as though they were Christians is not something that makes any sense. It, it, why, you can't go out and tell people, you don't believe this, you don't believe the fundamental assumptions that drive it, but I'm gonna ask you to produce these characteristics anyway. What sort of sense does that make? It only makes sense if they have come to believe that what you're saying about the nature of God and the nature of reality, the nature of creation is true. And so Christians want to proclaim and preach and declare the truth of God's created order, the truth of God's created design. When we declare that and we have an interaction and we have a free exchange of ideas and we tell you what we believe and we declare it and you come to believe it too, when you, when you come to believe it, then you will receive it uh, either return to the church or be baptized, come into the church, and then you will begin reflecting what you believe ultimate reality is. And all this is done in a very peaceable way. There's no, there's no reason for coming to blows. There's no reason for having uh, a, uh, a literal warfare. There's no reason for having that sort of thing. If uh, somebody's, somebody needs to get their phone. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, I, I want to keep reminding you. I, I, I like to, when I, when I was traveling with uh, Christopher Hitchens, one of the points I've, I've made, uh, and he and I got along famously, he had a lot more respect for free interaction of ideas than some folks do. Um, and, and, uh, so, so one, of the things that, one of the things I said in the, my interaction... One of the things I said in my interaction with Christopher uh, was, was this. There's two tenets to atheism. Number one, there's no God. Number two, I hate him. All right. And now the, the point is, the point is, and, <laughs> well, here's the, there's a Q&A later, and I'm, I'm happy, to, uh, happy to engage with those comments at, the, at, at the, those sorts of questions at the time. But Christians have a long history and a long experience of fielding the question, and it's a legitimate question. It's the, sort of, it's the sort of question that Christians are committed to answering because we think it's a good question. The question is this. You Christians say this, 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 and this. Why don't your lives match up with what you say? All right? That's a good question. That's a reasonable question. You Christians say that Jesus is the Messiah. What about the Spanish Inquisition? You Christians say this. What about the, uh, uh, what about the Crusades? You Christians say this. What about these inconsistencies? I think that's a fair cop. I think those are fair questions. And I think some of them have no good answer, and some of them have good answers, but it's a fair question. Why don't you live what you say you believe? And I would say to all the diversity mongers, why don't you live what you say you believe? Why don't you... You know, every, I, 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 diversity for everybody who thinks like me. That's, that's not diversity. Now, what, what, we want to do, what, what we want to do, I have, I have been in debates with atheists. I've been in de debates with people who are as far removed from my, pre, um, my assumptions and my convictions, my foundational assumptions as you could possibly be. I've been involved in those debates, and I know what it's like when people engage in a debate the way it ought to be engaged in. I know what that's like. I've seen it. And it's not here, right? You need to, you need to wake up. You're not committed to free speech. You're not committed, you're not committed to diversity. You're not committed to all the things you say that you're committed to. And there's only one way out. There's only one way out. And that way out, you're not going to be surprised to hear from me. I'm a preacher. I'm a Christian preacher. That way out is Jesus. And I... And so I want, to, I want to take a break now, and in the second talk we're going to talk about redemption sexuality, and I want to talk about how the gospel applies to these issues. For those of you who have 
um, attentively listened and tried to hear over some of the clamor. I want to thank not only Indiana University, but I want to thank you particularly for hearing me out whether or not you agree. And I hope that I see a number of you at the second talk. Thank you.